Okay, hi, once again, everybody. Um, this will be the last pre-recorded Tuesday lecture for our course, English 203, in this spring term of 2021. So this will be the lecture for Tuesday, April 13th. And um, uh, we're continuing, of course, and drawing toward the conclusion of our look at uh, Shakespeare's great late uh, tragedy, Anthony and Cleopatra. Um, last time I was talking about this play in terms of what I called in the title of that lecture, A Tale of Two Cities, those cities being of course uh, Rome and, and, and Alexandria, Alexandria standing for uh, Shakespeare's idea of Egypt in Roman times. And I was trying to make the point that um, <clears throat> even though maybe on the surface or at first glance um, it seems as though we're kind of supposed to root for Egypt against Rome and Anthony and Cleopatra. It isn't quite as simple as that. Uh, I was arguing uh, that, on, on the contrary, Shakespeare works pretty hard uh, to represent both of these political and cultural locations, both of these cities, quote-unquote, as dysfunctional, as, as grim, uh, in their respective ways. So uh, this play, the world of this play, is, 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 is a world of a kind of binary system uh, as we bop back and forth between uh, Rome and Egypt. Um, a binary system, meaning we have two opposed terms, uh, only one of which can kind of be turned on uh, at any one time. And um, given the dysfunction, let's say, that we see in both of these places, on both sides of that system, I think we can even say uh, that the the, the, the Rome-Egypt duality in Anthony and Cleopatra is, is not only binary, but kind of bipolar. In other words, uh, it is suggestive of the kind of mental illness that used to be called manic depression, you know, where somebody will be very, very, very up uh, one day, very, very, very low on another day. Certainly Anthony embodies this, and this is what I want to talk about a great deal more in the lecture today. Uh, the Anthony, the, 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 the fun, drunk, erotic Egyptian Anthony, whom we see in Act 1, Scene 1 of this play, is a totally different guy from the grim, sober, perhaps hungover, uh, Roman, attending to business Anthony, whom we see in Act 1, uh, Scene 2. Um, so, uh, two very different terms the Roman term and the Egyptian term in the world of uh, Anthony and Cleopatra. And I want to pursue this aspect of the play actually by taking a step back and um, reflecting briefly on, uh, on Roman history, uh, because that, as I've said, is certainly something Shakespeare is fascinated by and is trying to think through uh, in this play. You know, historically, Rome, uh, starts out just as a, as a city-state in central Italy, and then, for various reasons, first of all survival, then conquest, then economic expansion, it, 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 it becomes bigger. Uh, Rome extends its authority, first of all, across Italy, then across the Alps, into Gaul, into the German lands, Spain, what's now Britain, and all around the Mediterranean, until we come to the time of our play, when uh, Roman rule extends basically across Western Europe and around the entire Mediterranean basin, including, of course, to the ancient country of Egypt, which is a Roman province at uh, this time. So a process of, of colonial expansion, and of course it's from Latin that we get our word colonial, colonialism. The, the, the colonia was what the Romans called the, the, the camps that their armies established when they, when they marched through a region. And um, what that expansion means, of course, is that it is an encounter with other cultures. It's an encounter with places that are not Rome. And um, the bigger Rome gets, the more not Romes it encounters. And 
uh, the less and less like Rome, uh, let's say, they uh, become. Uh, and in the entire history of colonialism up until the present day, obviously, when the colonial culture, when the colonizing culture encounters other cultures, encounters difference, well, uh, it has to figure out how to deal with them. Uh, does the conquering culture try to erase the cultures that it encounters? Does it try to assimilate uh, the cultures that it encounters? Or does it try to come to some kind of, uh, let's say, accommodation or mutual uh, coexistence with the different cultures that it uh, encounters? Uh, and um, by the way, I added to our module a link to a, a, a Netflix series. It's a little bit corny, a little bit silly, of course, but basically very, very well done. It's called uh, Barbarians or, or Barbaren, uh, and it's about the encounter between uh, the Romans and the German tribes um, around about the same time as the time of, of our play. So if you're interested, check it out. It's really quite uh, well done. Um, okay. Um, so, Rome, I guess I'm trying to point to a kind of historical paradox, you see. Uh, as there is more Rome, as Rome expands, Rome, in a sense, becomes less Rome, you see, because Rome encounters and has to accommodate itself in one way or another to all kinds of different cultures which are, which are, which are not itself. As there is more Rome in one way, there is less Rome in another way. A powerful paradox, I think, historical paradox of colonial expansion and one that all countries and cultures throughout history since Roman times that have uh, expanded in that kind of colonizing way. All countries and cultures that have done that have encountered, I think, um, this paradox. Um, now, Anthony, uh, as we have previously discussed, Anthony, uh, in one way, uh, is, is, is the perfect Roman. So we, if we think about stereotypical Roman values, they include things like stoicism, martial valor, uh, brutality, imperviousness to discomfort, massive self-control. In one way, Shakespeare's Anthony embodies those values is kind of the ultimate Roman and I just want to turn once again uh, to Act 1 scene 4 of our play and just quote this speech that Caesar makes uh, in praise of Anthony so An Anthony isn't in this scene but 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 Caesar is addressing him you know in absentia the kind of thing that we call an apostrophe talking to somebody who isn't there uh, it's Act 1 scene 4 uh, from line 55 where Caesar says to the absent Anthony, he says, Anthony, leave thy lascivious with sails, parties. Leave thy lascivious with sails. When thou once was beaten from Medena, where thou slewst Hirtius and Pansa, consuls, at thy heel did famine follow, whom thou foughtst against, though daintily brought up, with patience more than savages could suffer. Thou didst drink the stale of horses, horse urine. Thou didst drink the stale of horses and the gilded puddle which beasts would cough at. Incredible lines. O only Shakespeare, I think, uh, could describe something so ugly and make it sound so beautiful, you see. Thou didst drink the stale of horses and the gilded puddle which beasts would cough at. Thy palate then did deign the roughest berry on the rudest hedge, yea, like the stag, when snow the pasture sheets the barks of trees thou brow. On the Alps, it is reported thou didst eat strange flesh, which some did die to look on. And all this, it wounds thine honor that I speak it now, was born so like a soldier that thy cheeks so much as lanked not. That's Caesar's magnificent speech in Act 1, Scene 4, about Anthony as the ultimate Roman. Uh, just astonishingly tough and disciplined and stoic and martial and brutal and, and able to... Uh, uh, you know, eat uh, barks of trees, strange flesh, which probably means cannibalism, if necessary, to survive. And all this, so th th thy cheeks so much as lanked not. Uh, you didn't even turn pale. You didn't even grow thin. Uh, you took it like, like a man. 
like a Roman. So that's, that's one side of Anthony. Um, but at the same time, and, and as we have already discussed, an, another side of Anthony is, is not the perfect Roman, he's actually the perfect Egyptian. So perfectly sensual, perfectly erotic, uh, excessively festive, fun, drunk, um, accessible, um, all that stuff. So he's both the perfect Roman and the perfect Egyptian, but, and here's the thing, um, it, it's clear that, at least at the beginning of our play, Anthony is operating under a kind of, of, of theory, we could say, I guess, a kind of ethical theory, that he has to keep the two sides of himself entirely separate. Um, uh, and um, <clears throat> as though that's the only way he can make sense of these two sides of his being, these two major sides of his being, the Roman side and the Egyptian side. They are so incompatible, Anthony seems to think, that uh, they have to be kept on completely opposite sides of the leisure and they can never meet uh, any more than Cleopatra can ever meet either of Anthony's uh, proper Roman wives. Uh, and I, I was saying a moment ago that uh, in the process of colonial expansion that Rome underwent, there lay hidden a, a kind of, uh, of paradox in terms of the relationship between Rome and its non-Roman others. As there is more Rome, there is, in a way, less Rome. Uh, and Anthony, I think, himself embodies a version of this paradox precisely because Anthony is good at so very many things, to the extent that he can even be the perfect Roman when he is in Rome and the perfect Egyptian when he is uh, in Egypt. Um, uh, I, it, it's pretty clear, I think, that, that Shakespeare wants to represent his Anthony, uh, and I'm going to lay on a slight philosophical reference here, but uh, don't be alarmed. <laughs> Shakespeare wants to represent his Anthony as the kind of person that Aristotle called a magnanimos, magnanimos. We don't need to know that term. It's just kind of cool. Uh, magnanimos means a great-souled person, or a person of great soul. Uh, and that means uh, the kind of person, uh, again, who um, uh, expands. A person who isn't limited. Uh, a person who doesn't just say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm good at the Roman martial fighting stuff, but don't hand me that Egyptian sensual erotic stuff, uh, which is the kind of person that, uh, that Caesar is in this play, for example. Uh, no, the magnanimous or the great-souled person, as another philosopher, Nietzsche, will say, uh, this kind of person says yes to everything, Nietzsche says. The great-souled man says yes to everything. So, yes to discipline, yes to fighting, yes to the army, yes to colonialism, but also yes to drinking, yes to having fun, yes to Cleopatra, yes to dancing, yes to cross-dressing, yes, 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 yes. Uh, and Anthony uh, is like that. He expands. Um, but just as Rome encounters a paradox as to what it is through its very process of expansion, as there is more Rome, it seems that there is less Rome. So Anthony, in Shakespeare's play, encounters this kind of paradox through his expansion, as he becomes uh, better and better at more and more things, as he becomes both Roman and Egyptian. There's, there's more Anthony in one way, uh, and yet, in another way, there is less Anthony. It's hard for Anthony to figure out what Anthony is. How can uh, there be both this Roman man and this Egyptian man uh, in the same person? And Anthony's initial response, at least, to this paradox, as I'm trying to suggest in our play, is very much to keep these two sides of himself separate. Um, and so we get, then, this well, kind of crazy uh, bipolar bopping back and forth between the Roman and the Egyptian Anthony. 
Now, uh, that's, that's dysfunction, that's uh, unsustainable, that's uh, sick. Uh, and the obvious alternative, which the play then is holding out, uh, is not to keep these two sides of himself separate, but rather to explore the possibility of a new synthesis, to see whether these two things can't go together. So, um, if you like, the, 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 the Romans in the play look at uh, the Egyptian side of Anthony, and they say, well, you can't do that. You can't be, you know, both the ultimate Roman and the ultimate Egyptian. Uh, the answer, I think, that the play wants to hold out and wants us to explore is basically, well, why not? Why the heck not? Uh, why choose? Um, if you are an Anthony, maybe you can do both and even do both at uh, the same time. Now, uh, Anthony, as represented to us by Shakespeare, is actually very, very good at this synthesis of the Roman and the Egyptian, even though Anthony himself, I think, kind of struggles to recognize that. Uh, and I guess the main line of thought that I want to pursue in the lecture today uh, is uh, precisely Shakespeare showing us an Anthony who is good at being both, uh, good at that synthesis of the Roman and Egyptian sides of himself, good at coming up, if you like, with an entirely new way of being, uh, which is not being Roman or Egyptian, but just being Anthony. Uh, Shakespeare represents Anthony as being very, very good at that, but not quite realizing it. And I guess the story I want to tell uh, about the play is one in which Anthony does come to realize that to some extent uh, by the end. But I want to, uh, for now, pursue this line of thought by turning to Act 2, uh, Scene 7 in our play, Okay, uh, Act 2, Scene 7, that's the long, fantastic, to some extent rather confusing scene where uh, Anthony, Caesar, and Lepidus, the three triumvirs, uh, have a kind of party on Sextus Pompeius's boat. Uh, and uh, it matters a lot, I think, that they're on a boat. Uh, that's something that we can talk about in tutorial, but you know, what's a boat? Well, it's a special kind of world. It's, it's, it, it's separated off from the, uh, from the land. Uh, it's, it's on a shifting uh, surface, the surface of the water. It's, it, it's fluidity. Uh, the possibilities are open uh, when uh, you are uh, on the water uh, like that. And as we see later in the play, uh, the sea is actually very much associated symbolically with Egypt as opposed to Rome. So the, the, the boat where they have this party in Act 2, Scene 7, is a kind of liminal space, which means it's an in-between space between the Roman and the Egyptian. Uh, and what they are doing, what these characters are doing in Act 2, Scene 7, is, uh, along the same lines, a kind of in-between activity. They are having this kind of drinking party uh, in, in the wake of peace negotiations, and it's supposed to uh, stabilize or solidify the agreement they've come to. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it is extremely festive, it is excessive, there's a lot of drinking, people are getting very drunk, and in that way it is Egyptian. So, the point I'm trying to make, the, the, the Act 2, Scene 7 scenario is a scenario of cultural mixing, the Roman and the Egyptian coming together in various ways in the same time and space. And the point that I want to make right now, which is really quite simple, is again, Anthony is very good at this. We even, we could say he's in his element. Uh, in this scenario of cultural mixing the Roman and the Egyptian in Act 2, Scene 7. And we see that in part because uh, the other Roman characters, notably Caesar and Lepidus, are really not very good at this. Uh, in fact, they are very much out of their elements in this scene. Uh, and I'm going to turn to, uh, let's say, Act 2, Scene 7 from uh, line 84. 
and we'll come back to this scene later in the lecture. Uh, so they're drinking. Lepidus is getting very, very, very drunk. In fact, has to be has to be carried uh, off the boat, carried ashore uh, at Act Two, Scene Seven, a line eighty-four. Again, so Pompey saying, "This health to Lepidus. Another another drink for Lepidus." Anthony says to a servant, "Bear him ashore. I'll pledge it for him." Pompey. Enobarbus pledges a drink to, to Minas. Minas pledges a drink to Enobarbus. Pompey says, fill till the cup be hid. Uh, and um, there, there, there's some jokes that, that follow uh, about how drunk Lepidus is and so on. Uh, and then coming down to line uh, 93, uh, Pompey says, this is not yet an Alexandrian feast. Anthony says, it ripens towards it. Strike the vessels, ho, here's to Caesar. Caesar, not having a very good time. Caesar says at line 95, I could well forbear it. Like, I'd rather not. Have another drink, Caesar. I could well forbear it. It's monstrous labor when I wash my brain and it grow fouler, Caesar says with, with you know, grim, charmless uh, Roman uh, stoicism. Uh, he, he says there, it's awful for me to, 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 to wash my brain with drink and, and, and yet it gets dirtier. Uh, because I'm getting drunk and I don't like that. Caesar losing control in that Egyptian way, uh, participating in this quasi-Egyptian festivity, Caesar is out of his element, does not like it at all. Anthony says to him uh, very directly and, and, and wonderfully, I think, at line 98, he says, be a child of the time. Be a child of the time. Just go with it. Uh, and Anthony, again, is very, very good at that. Uh, and that sets him apart from uh, his fellow Romans. Uh, he is more than capable of being a child of a time. Um, uh, and yet, again, he doesn't quite seem to realize, Anthony doesn't, that he can do this, that he can synthesize the two sides of his being uh, and that in, in doing that, he precisely becomes himself in being a child of the time. What Anthony does, for the most part throughout the play, as I have already been suggesting today, is he tries to compartmentalize. He thinks it has to be one or the other, Rome or Egypt. Um, um, and uh, that, of course, doesn't only mean that he chooses Rome uh, over Egypt, but it means that he, he keeps them separate. And so I want to pursue this line of thought through the two great battles that are represented to us in the latter part of the play, uh, when the conflict, as the conflict between uh, Anthony and Caesar comes to a head and they have a, they have a two-pronged civil war. Lepidus is out of the picture by this point to see who's going to rule the Roman world. And this, of course, is a war that Caesar was destined uh, to win. Uh, they, they fight two great battles. The first one, a, a, a sea battle, which is represented to us in and around uh, Act 3, Scene 7. I'm not going to look at that part of the text with you just now, but um, uh, it's... it's a puzzle in the play, and of course it's very much presented to us as a puzzle in this part of the play, why Anthony chooses to fight by sea. Everybody is saying to him, no, uh, you, you, you're at a disadvantage if you fight Caesar's navy. Uh, you, you're, you're at a massive advantage if you fight Caesar's army, so we should fight by land, not by sea. Uh, and uh, Shakespeare even gives us, I, I will turn to this very briefly, uh, Shakespeare even gives us uh, in Act Three. Uh, scene seven, a, a wonderfully corny uh, intervention by a soldier called Scarus. Uh, oh, and, and Caesar loves, actually, uh, Shakespeare loves the incipient ridiculousness of Latin names. Think about that. A, a, a soldier called Scarus. That's pretty funny, right? Elsewhere uh, in, in this play, there is a, 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 an officer called Silius. <laughs> so... Uh, pity the actor who has to say Silius uh, with a straight face uh, on stage here. Anyway, uh, Act 3, Scene 7, it's line um, 60 and below. 
Uh, Anthony's storming off to fight this sea battle that he's just intent on. Uh, this soldier, Scarus, kind of puts his hand up. Uh, uh, Anthony says to him at line 60, How now, worthy soldier? Scarus says, O oh, noble emperor, do not fight by sea. Trust not to rotten planks. Do you misdoubt this sword and these my wounds? Let the Egyptians and the Phoenicians go a-ducking. We have used to conquer standing on the earth and fighting foot to foot. That's the Roman way. And Anthony, Anthony doesn't even really answer him. He says, um, well, anyway, uh, and uh, off uh, he goes to fight by sea. Everybody says, don't fight by sea. And they are right, of course. Anthony suffers a terrible and a humiliating defeat uh, in uh, this sea battle, and it is almost all over for him uh, at that point. Uh, why does he fight by sea? Well, you guys, I think it's actually relatively simple, even though nobody understands it in the play. Anthony fights by sea in this battle because sea is associated with Egypt. The ocean is fluid, the ocean is limitless, the ocean is excessive, uh, the ocean is troped female. Uh, Anthony fights by sea because he thinks at this part of the play he has to be all Egyptian, you see? Uh, he's made that choice, he's made that commitment. He has, in effect, married Cleopatra and been crowned, or crowned himself, emperor. Uh, but this is Anthony bopping back, you see, from Rome to Egypt. And in bopping back from Rome to Egypt, he, think it has to, he thinks it has to be just Egypt and all Egypt, one way or the other compartmentalized. And so he, he insists on fighting by sea because in some way that's Egyptian and he's Egyptian now. Uh, that does not work out for him. But then we can compare what happens after that terrible setback of the uh, sea battle. We can compare that to the land battle uh, which occurs in Act 4 of the play. Um, now, uh, Anthony has, it's kind of Anthony's last gasp. Um, he's, he, he's in a way following everybody's advice, finally, to fight by land. Now, land is, is the Roman way to be sure, but what I think is fascinating about the, the, um, the late Anthony, so to speak, that Shakespeare gives us in Act Four is that he really has become a kind of mixed Anthony, a synthesized Anthony, uh, not Roman or Egyptian, but both at once. And we can pick that up, uh, please, from Act 4, uh, Scene 2. Um, Act 4, Scene 2, the night before the battle, uh, the battle which is either going to finish Anthony off or maybe give him a renewed lease on life. Uh, and uh, what does Anthony do in Act 4, Scene 2, the night before the battle? Does he, in good Roman fashion, uh, you know, eat, 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 eat a steak dinner and go to bed early? No, he, he gets drunk. He gets drunk uh, with his soldiers. Um, uh, he, he makes a, a wonderfully sensitive speech in Act 4, Scene 2. Uh, just stay with me to one more day, you guys. I love you so much. They're all crying. Uh, this is not a Roman martial stoic disciplined restrained Anthony. It's a it's an open Anthony, a, 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 a sensual Anthony, a loving Anthony. The night before the battle, so it's not Roman or Egyptian again. Uh, it's both, and then we can turn to the wonderful Act Four, Scene Four, uh, which is the scene of Anthony getting up on the morning of the battle and putting his armor on. Uh, the, the, the scene, Act 4, Scene 4, begins uh, with Anthony calling his armorer. So if you're a guy like Anthony in the ancient world, you have a servant whose job it is to help you get your armor on uh, before you go out to fight because it's relatively complex and difficult to get that stuff on. Uh, Anthony's armorer, of course, is called Eros, <laughs> love, erotic love. So uh, Anthony wakes up on the morning of the battle calling Eros, calling to love, erotic love. Eros, mine armor, Eros. Cleopatra, sleep a little. Uh, Anthony, no, my chuck. Eros, come, mine armor, Eros. Enter Eros with armor. Come, good fellow, put thine iron on. If fortune be not ours today, it is because we braver. Come. 
Eros begins to arm Anthony. Cleopatra says, nay, I'll help too. What's this for? She attempts to assist Eros. Anthony saying, ah, let be, let be. Thou art the armor of my heart. False, false. This, this. As Cleopatra haplessly and funnily tries to assist him with getting his armor on. Uh, Cleopatra says to him at line 11, is not this buckled well? Anthony, rarely, rarely. He that unbuckles this till we do please to doff it for our repose shall hear a storm. Thou fumblest Eros and my queen's esquire more tight at this than thou dispatch. It is an absolutely incredible little scene of Anthony getting ready to go off to battle, the decisive and last battle of his life, uh, but getting ready to go off to battle in a kind of, in a kind of cloud of sexual comedy. Uh, double entendres about buckling and what's tight and, 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 and taking it off for our repose later and, and, and be, being the armor of my heart and all with an armorer uh, wh whose name is Eros, Love, Cupid. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. This is synthetic Anthony. Uh, neither Roman nor Egyptian, neither martial nor sensual, but both and all of these things at once. And then what is so great about this, of course, is that it's precisely this Anthony, this mixed synthetic new kind of person uh, who wins his greatest victory in the land battle uh, that follows. Uh, and uh, we can turn to conclude this point uh, we can turn to Act 4, Scene 9, when Anthony comes back to Cleopatra uh, in a kind of triumph. Um, and uh, he says to her at Act 4, Scene 9, line uh, 13, I guess it is, he says to her, O thou day of the world, chain mine armed neck, leap thou attire and all through proof of harness to my heart, and there ride on the pants triumphing ride on the pants, triumphing, an astonishingly uh, sexual image uh, coming out of Anthony's mouth at the end of the greatest victory of his life, just as he walked into that greatest victory of his life through again, as I said, that, that, that cloud of romantic comedy uh, lying in bed too late uh, with uh, Cleopatra after having been up drinking uh, all night the night before. So, uh, the point again that this so far, uh, and to wind up, it's not especially difficult. Anthony is at his best in this play when he gets over that idea of having to compartmentalize, having to be one thing or the other, when Anthony instead opens himself up to the possibility of becoming more than that, of being uh, the different sides of his being at once. Uh, and that uh, somehow means being himself and being uh, his greatest self. Um, and yet this thought remains difficult uh, or becomes difficult in a new way maybe. Uh, this paradox of identity that Shakespeare's Anthony uh, embodies. Um, there's a lot of talk in this play about Anthony being Anthony or not being Anthony or you are not Anthony when you are in Caesar's company or uh, whatever. Uh, and it's that paradox, that difficulty that I, that I think Shakespeare is trying to resolve. We see, as I've said, this synthetic Anthony, this, this both Roman and Egyptian Anthony, briefly in passing, let's say, in the play. Um, but it is indeed in passing because Anthony is going to go on to be defeated. He is going to die. Uh, and uh, so it's as though, I guess, and again, here is where the thought becomes really difficult all over again. It's as though this personal and cultural synthesis of the Roman and the Egyptian, even though we do see it happening and we're given an opportunity to grasp it in Anthony and Cleopatra, to some extent it runs through our fingers. It comes and it goes. It escapes us to some extent, just as it escapes 
Anthony. Uh, and I want to finish up this lecture by turning back to uh, Act 2, Scene 7, where there's a wonderful moment uh, and a very famous one uh, where Shakespeare um, lays down a kind of baseline, let's say, for these paradoxes of identity that I've been trying to talk about uh, today. And um, ultimately, we have here in Act 2, Scene 7, it's Act 2, Scene 7 from line 40. We have Shakespeare giving us um, a look at definition, let's say, which has the potential, if we can figure out how to do it, has the potential to reconnect to the title of our course and the, uh, the paradoxical, shifting, mercurial discourses of love that we have been talking about over the last uh, almost 13 weeks. Um, the scene that I'm getting at and want to talk about now, Act 2, Scene 7 from line 40, is the scene uh, where uh, we get the definition of the crocodile, okay? Uh, the crocodile being, of course, from the Roman perspective, a, a very exotic Egyptian animal, which they've heard of, but perhaps have never seen. And um, Lepidus, very drunk in this, in this boat party scene, uh, is asking Anthony to tell him about the crocodile. Um, Lepidus says at line 40, What manner of thing is your crocodile? <laughs> Anthony answers very famously, he says, It is shaped, sir, like itself, and it is as broad as it hath breadth. It is just so high as it is, and moves with its own organs. It lives by that which nourisheth it, and the elements once out of it, it transmigrates. Those la that last sentence is a little bit difficult. It just means uh, it, it, it lives by what it lives by, you know, by, by, by what it eats. Uh, and um, it... It, it dies uh, when it comes to the end of its life, when it comes to the end of its uh, capacity for life. It lives by that which nourisheth it, and the elements once out of it, it transmigrates. Lepidus asks, what color is it of? Anthony says, of its own color too. And Lepidus says, tis a strange serpent. Anthony answers, tis so, and the tears of it are wet. Uh, and Shakespeare is very keen for us to notice this little exchange between Anthony and the very drunk uh, Lepidus, uh, he, he's keen enough that he gives Caesar an aside, uh, who says to Anthony, will this description satisfy him? D did, Lepidus, did, did, did Lepidus think that you just, you know, said something informative? Will this description satisfy him? Uh, Anthony says, well, sure, he's so drunk. Uh, he'll, 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 he'll take anything, he'll accept anything. The definition of the crocodile uh, that Anthony gives is, of course, completely empty. Lepidus asks him what kind of, what kind of creature it is. Uh, Anthony answers him by saying, well, uh, it, 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 it has its own shape. It's as broad as it hath breadth. It's as high as it is high. It eats what it eats, and it dies when uh, it can't live anymore. Also, it is of its own color, and the tears of it are wet. Um, and uh, here, you guys, I think we end up on very, very difficult, uh, actually, uh, intellectual territory, um, which we don't necessarily need to um, conquer, as it were, but uh, which we should just gesture at. Um, the, the, the kind of definition that, that Anthony gives Lepidus, the definition of the crocodile that he gives, it's constructed out of uh, statements that philosophers will call tautologies, which means uh, statements that are, that, are, that are true merely by virtue of their logical form. And, and we don't need to know that. What we need to notice is that uh, the definition Anthony gives of the crocodile is completely empty. Right? It's completely uninformative. Uh, the crocodile is its own color, its own size, its own shape, eats what it eats, dies when it dies, and has wet tears. That's no definition at all. Um, 
the paradox which emerges here, and I think it is a very difficult and a very profound one, is that the definition of the crocodile is perfectly coherent. Um, if you say that something is its own shape, uh, if you say that something is its own color, uh, logically speaking, that is a perfectly coherent kind of statement. It's just that it is completely uninformative, uh, completely empty. And there's then a profound relationship between the logical coherence of the statement and its emptiness. The definition of the crocodile that Anthony gives Lepidus, you see, is like one of those hoops, that symbol that uh, comes up again and again and again in his play. Uh, a circle, closed, completely coherent, but empty. That's the crocodile as defined by Anthony. Whatever Anthony himself is, and however we are to understand his attempt to synthesize the Roman and the Egyptian in this play, let's put it this way. He is the opposite of the crocodile. Anthony is the person who is always having to be defined or always having to define himself in terms of things he is not, rather than in terms of things that he is. The ultimate Roman who is also the ultimate Egyptian, the Anthony who is not Anthony. And when Anthony looks at what is not Anthony, he actually recognizes Anthony. That's a terrible and a painful paradox, uh, let's say. That paradox emerging from the expansion of Anthony, the great souled uh, person. Um, the challenge that I think Shakespeare holds out to us through his character of Anthony uh, is the challenge of perceiving a new kind of coherence precisely by seeing that what is not Anthony can be Anthony. What is not us can be us. What is not Rome can be Rome. Uh, the challenge is to see that as a mode of identity. And the mode of identity that we have there, I think, is the kind of thing that we can call growth. Becoming more than you are, different from what you were, and yet recognizing that precisely in becoming different, in becoming more, you actually find the way to your own being in a way that is informative and wonderful rather than being closed and empty like the definition of the crocodile. Okay, uh, I'm going to wrap up there. Uh, there remains some very interesting stuff for us to talk about in our final uh, real-time lecture uh, on Thursday, uh, and so I will see, I hope, uh, a bunch of you guys then. Thank you very much.